Let's look at the data for TMS and depression. These are the first randomized controlled trials that were done. The original Neuronetics trial of 301 subjects was published in 2007, and that was the basis for the FDA approval. Mayo Clinic Rochester was one of the sites for this study. The National Institutes of Mental Health funded a study of 190 subjects, which was published in 2010. And in 2015, Brainsway published their deep TMS trial of 212 patients that was used for their device approval. For the Neuronetics trial, they took 301 patients and randomized them to either TMS or a sham treatment. Patients had to have a certain severity of depression, and their current episode of depression had to be less than three years, and they couldn't have had more than four antidepressant trials or intolerance to antidepressants in that current episode of depression. So they didn't pick the people who are really, really treatment-resistant with six or seven failed antidepressants. All of the patients were given Monday through Friday daily 40-minute sessions for six weeks, and the treatment was left-sided 10 hertz at 120% of motor threshold. The results of the study are shown here. On the left side are the response rates, and if you look at week four, you'll see that active versus sham starts to separate out. The response rate is 19.4% for active and 11.6% for sham. At week six, it separates out even more, 23.9% for active versus 15.1% for sham. If you look at the right side at the remission scores, that doesn't separate out until week six, where you have 17.4% of patients getting active treatment in remission compared to only 8.2% who received sham with remission. So let's pause and think about these numbers. Let's look at the response rate and round the numbers to 25% got better when they got the active treatment and 15% got better with sham. So what are some ways to think about these results? The overall response rate, is it impressive? If you have depression and you were offered a treatment which had a one in four chance of helping, would you be really excited? The numbers aren't overwhelmingly impressive, but keep in mind that it's a randomized trial and we might expect lower rates for randomized trials versus open-label trials. Also remember, these are patients with treatment-resistant depression. Then the next question, did the treatment work? Well, it was about two to one success for patients who received active versus sham. So the treatment arm certainly got better and treatment certainly made a difference. But a certain number of patients who got sham also got better, which points out that the placebo effect exists, even for TMS. There were several weaknesses of the Neuronetics trial. One of them was that the patients could probably tell if they were getting the active versus sham treatment because the active would hurt a lot more than the sham. Another was that the treatment location of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was not accurate enough. And then that it was sponsored by the company that made the device. So the NIMH sponsored a randomized trial to address these concerns. They used an active sham where there was some discomfort with the sham, and then they used MRI to locate the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The duration of the treatment was also different, with patients stopping after three weeks if they did not get better, and they had 190 patients in their analysis. Here are the results of that study. The primary outcome measure was remission, and 14% of patients who got active remitted versus 5% for sham. The response rates were similar. The odds ratio showed it was 4.2 times more likely to remit if you were getting active treatment. There's another part of the study where those who didn't remit with a randomized trial could participate in open-label follow-up. So about 30% of those who didn't get better with TMS in the randomized part then achieved remission with open-label treatment. I should mention that in the Neuronetics trial, there was also a similar part where those who didn't respond to randomize could get open-label treatment, and it was about 50% response. 
The next study is the Brain's Way Deep TMS study. Patients had to have failed one to four antidepressants or had at least two antidepressants that were not tolerated. They analyzed 212 patients. They used 18 hertz stimulation, 1,980 pulses per treatment, which took about 20 minutes for each treatment, and 20 treatment sessions over four weeks. So these parameters are faster than the 10 hertz, 3,000 pulse, and 40 minute treatments that the other studies used. And it's also shorter duration than 30 treatments in six weeks of the other studies. There's a maintenance aspect to this research study also where they gave additional bi-weekly treatments for 12 weeks. Here are the results of this study. The primary outcome was the change in the Hamilton depression rating score in the acute phase, and the improvement was only 3.1 points in the active arm, and that just missed statistical significance in the intent-to-treat group. Although in the protocol group, it was statistically significant. For the secondary outcomes, the response rate for active was 37% versus 27.8% for sham. And then for remission, 30.4% versus 15.8%. Since FDA approval of TMS for depression, there are many reports of how patients do when they're directly given TMS. These are open-label or naturalistic studies. The first large one was published in 2012. The authors evaluated 307 patients at 42 different sites getting Neurostar TMS. This study used the PHQ-9 to measure results, and the response rate was 56.4%, and the remission rate was 28.7%. This is a very practical number to use when I'm talking to patients about the success rate of TMS. Neuronetics has a large national outcomes registry which keeps growing. In 2020, they published a report of 5,010 patients with 3,814 who completed TMS with at least 20 sessions and had a PHQ-9 score at the beginning and end of treatment. The response rate using PHQ-9 was between 58 to 69 percent, with the highest response for completers using only left-sided stimulations, as opposed to other stimulation protocols such as left and right-sided stimulations. Remission rate was 28 to 36 percent. Their study did not find any difference in the response between younger and older patients. With this registry, they also studied two different treatment protocols. The standard TMS protocol is daily 10 hertz stimulation over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Another treatment protocol is to alternate 10 hertz left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with 1 hertz right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, based on some studies showing that right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can help with depression, but also with anxiety. So this study compared patients in their national registry, which had one or the other protocol. There were six times as many patients who were treated with left unilateral compared to the bilateral protocol. The left unilateral protocol is what was used for FDA approval. So after looking at the data in many different ways, their conclusion was that the left unilateral group had better outcomes than the bilateral group. In early 2023, they reported outcomes of anxious depression defined as major depressive disorder with a GAD7 anxiety score of 10 or greater. The finding was that both anxiety and depression improved. In patients who had high baseline anxiety, the improvement in depression wasn't as much as those who had low baseline anxiety, but the improvement was still high, about 58% in the intent-to-treat group and 67% in the completer group. Keep in mind that approval was not for TMS for primary anxiety disorders, as there's still not enough evidence for that condition. Now let's look at the data which got ITBS approved. It was a randomized non-inferiority trial of 385 adult patients ages 18 to 65 years and 192 were assigned to standard 10 hertz TMS and 193 assigned to ITBS. Each ITBS treatment was 3 minutes and 9 seconds 
versus 37.5 minutes for 10 hertz RTMS. Both groups received four to six weeks of five days per week treatment. If at four weeks there was at least 30% improvement, but not remission, the treatments continued to six weeks. The primary outcome was the 17-item Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, with a non-inferiority margin of 2.25 points. The Hamilton Rating Scale baseline and end scores were basically the same for both groups, as was the response rate. In this table, I included the response rates for the quids self-rating scale that was also used, and the response rate was 40% for both groups. Pain was rated higher in the TBS group. It was 3.8 out of 10 versus 3.4 out of 10 for the RTMS group. And the dropout rates were similar with 8% in the TBS and 6% in the TMS group. So this is an important study which tells us that standard 10 hertz RTMS and ITBS have the same outcomes. One question that patients will ask is about the durability or relapse rate for TMS. A systematic review published in 2019 answered that question. It included 18 studies between 2002 and 2018, which reported depression outcomes three or more months after RTMS. The majority of these studies, at least 11, had some form of maintenance TMS. The systematic review results are shown here. For patients who responded to the acute course of TMS at three months, two-thirds still maintained the response. At six months, it was about half, and at 12 months, it was a little less than half. In my clinical practice, I tell patients that the response rate of TMS is about 50% at six months. Which brings us to another good question. Should patients get maintenance TMS? There's a small amount of evidence that maintenance TMS can help, but not enough evidence for insurance companies to cover maintenance TMS. So practically, from a cost standpoint, patients won't get maintenance TMS. But pretty much all insurance companies will cover retreatment with TMS if the patient's mood holds up for at least three months after the acute course, TMS. Key points. In randomized trials, the response rate for active versus sham is not impressive, about 25% versus 11%, but it is about twice as high. Open-label or naturalistic studies show up to 70% response rate. About 60% seems to be a realistic number to tell patients. The relapse rate at six months is about 50%, and ITBS showed non-inferiority to TMS.